Words at War. to give a signal to the enemy, huh? This will teach you, you swine. Oh, stop it's... it, stop it, you fool, you kill him. And what's wrong with that? He's a traitor. He set fire to the haystack. Look, it's shaped like an arrow and points to you the factory. You fool, if you kill him now, how are we going to find out who his accomplices are? In the stomach. Why couldn't you have shot him in the leg, you fool? Why don't you use your brain? I, I was only trying to do my duty. I saw... Never mind what you saw. Let's get him to the hospital immediately. There they come. They saw the signal to be back tomorrow night. And then it'll be all over for us. We must get to Herr Bomber at once. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with the Council on Books in Wartime, presents another of the most widely discussed programs in America, Words at War, dramatizing the most representative books to come out of this great world conflict. Tonight, Albert Maltz's new novel about Germany, The Cross and the Arrow, dramatized for radio by Ben Kagan. Herr Bama, I'm Commissar Kerr, Gestapo. Yes, uh, come in, Commissar. I've been expecting you. Uh, now I'll give you the background of the case. We make medium tanks here, uh, turn them out like rolls. We used to be in Dusseldorf, but the bombings got too hot, so we were moved seven months ago. As you'll see tomorrow, we're situated in a wood. All around us is farming community. Our camouflage people have done a first-rate job. In eight months, there have been British planes over here, but always after another objective. But tonight, our worker here tried to signal the plane. How? My dear uh, Commissar, I have no intention of keeping it a secret from you. On the east edge of the factory, there's a farm. The owner is a widow, Frau Ling. Her hay has recently been cut. The saboteur named Wegler piled the hay in an arrow pointing toward the factory. When the planes came over, he touched it off. It so happens our SS men were close by on patrol. The woman Ling yelled. We got there in time to douse the fire before it burned too long. Do you think the British planes spotted the fire? I don't know, but uh, we have to act on that possibility. Naturally, we'll take all protective measures. But meanwhile, if they didn't see the arrow, there's danger that the scum working with Wegler will try again. And that's why you're here. Do you know for a fact that the saboteur is part of a group? No, I assume it. Was there anyone with him tonight? Not that we know. You've examined him? He's in the hospital with a bullet in his gut. Who knows if he'll ever be able to talk to him. Bad. Well, I want Wegler's record, of course, and the record of every friend of his in the factory. What about the farm woman? She and Wegler were going to be married. That's how Wegler came to be on her farm in the first place. The woman who betrayed him? Yes. Hmm. What reason? I haven't talked to her. Uh, there hasn't been time. Besides, she was hysterical. Uh, she ought to be ready for questioning now. Good. Well, by the way, when do you suppose you'll be able to talk to Wegler? I don't know. He's still unconscious. I've left instructions with Dr. Soder at the hospital to let me know as soon as he comes out of the anesthetic. It seems the doctor isn't sure yet whether Wegler will live. Do you know of any reason why Wegler would have wanted to see the factory destroyed by the British? Was there any personal motivation? None. As a matter of fact, only yesterday he was awarded a medal for being the best type of German worker. And he had every reason for hating the British. His wife was killed in an air raid and his son died in the Battle of Narvik. I see. All right, Herr Bomber. And I shall proceed at once. Nurse, nurse, what is Vegler's temperature now? 99, Dr. Soda. Uh, up a few points. Take his pulse every half hour, nurse. Really now, as though every hour weren't enough. Damn it, woman, will you do as I say? We must bring him out of the ether quickly. Yes, sir. It's not that I mind, only I don't like to see you lose your calm. A doctor should be calm. What happens to a patient when a doctor isn't calm? He dies. He dies. He's buried and the worms enjoy him. Sooner will happen to you, nurse. Now every half hour. Remember, I want you to call me at once if his pulse goes higher than 101. Yes, sir. The drip infusion is to continue. You might be putting some wet gauze on his lips. Yes, sir. Very well. Now, you take care of him properly. He must be in condition to talk by morning. He must die first. What will happen? I, I'm waking up. I've been asleep. No, no. I've been sick. There's a 
pain in my belly. Yes, I, I remember now. The elite guard. The flash of moonlight on the rifle barrel. I must be in the factory hospital. I'm wounded and trapped. As soon as they find out I'm conscious, they'll be after me to talk. Bauma will come. He will want to know who my accomplices were. He will want to know why I signaled the British planes. They will force me to talk. There is a solution. I must kill myself and quickly. The only thing I have to do is rip off the bandage. But then... How will I know? How will I know if the British plane saw the arrow? I must know. I must remain alive until tomorrow night. Well, nurse? He hasn't stirred. Pulse 105. No septicemia. Peculiar. Very peculiar. Could it be a cranial injury, doctor? I don't see any signs of it. But I don't quite understand this extended unconsciousness. Look at him. He lies there like a log. Doesn't even stir. Nurse, I want you to look in at him every 15 minutes. And call me the instant he comes to. So, they think I have a skull injury. Good. The only thing I have to do is lie like a log, as the doctor expressed it. If, if only the throbbing in the belly would stop... <laughs> Oh, it will be hard this way. No mistake about that. But it must be done. Not a sound shall escape from my lips. Not a sound. Oh. Dear God, make the British planes come. Make them come tonight. And help me think of something. I must not give in to this pain. Rowling, come in. Sit down, please. You have my deepest admiration. What you did tonight earns the gratitude of every German. My name is Commissar Kerr. What about the man Wegler, Commissar? He's in the hospital here. He's all right? The operator, we don't know yet. What will happen if he gets well? He'll be executed for treason, of course. So? Good. Very good. Still, it must be hard on you. On me? Why should I care? You were going to be married, weren't you? I? No such thing. A complete mistake, sir. To him? Ah. I see. Well, tell me what happened tonight. Well, I was in bed. Something woke me up. I don't know what. Then I saw him through the window running in the fields. So I yelled to him. The window was open, but he didn't stop. I could see that he was doing something with the hay, but I didn't know what. I ran outside. He wouldn't talk to me. And when I tried to stop him, he knocked me down. Then when he began to pour the kerosene on the hay... I understood what he was doing. I saw the way he had the hay piled, I mean. I ran toward the fire and yelled. He ran after me with a pitchfork. He wanted to kill me. That's all. Nothing more that you can think of? Anything he ever said that would be a clue? No. Oh, you haven't been frank with me. I think I know why. For a simple, honest woman like you, the Gestapo Commissaire seems a strange man. Oh, you mustn't be afraid. I, the Gestapo Commissaire, am relying on you to help me. Oh, you know Wegler, and you can tell me about him. You were going to be married to him. No, I told you before. He was an acquaintance. Very good. You want me to consider your link with a traitor? Very good, I will. For some reason you're denying what everybody knows. That you knew, Vegler, that you were lovers, that you intended to be married. It's a lie. For goodness sake, woman. It was you who called the guards and saved the factory. Why are you lying now? Perhaps there'll have to be two customers for the axe. An axe isn't particular, you know. The head rolls into the basket just the oh, same. Please, please. Out with it, woman. And I want the truth. I was so afraid. I didn't know what might happen to me. Nothing will happen to you. I was going to marry him. He was at my house tonight. Then he left. I thought to go home to the barracks. I went to my room. Then I saw him like I told you. The rest is just how I said. Why did he do it? That's what I want to know. Why? No. He told me he was going to do something. Something important, he said. I asked him what, but he wouldn't tell. He said we were both guilty because of the pole. Guilty? What does that mean? That's what he said. It sounds crazy to me. Who's the Pole? On my farm, a prisoner. He works for me now. I bought him. Vagler was mixed up with the Pole, eh? No, he couldn't have been. I've only had the Pole since two nights ago. There was no time. Oh, in that case, why did he say he was guilty? That's what I don't know. I've been thinking all night. 
I think he was crazy. Yes? Why do you think so? To do a thing like that. He had no reason. How do you know he had no reason? Oh, he was always patriotic. You suspected nothing? He never said anything? You think I wouldn't have reported the slightest thing? Did he ever criticize the party leaders? Oh, no, no, sir. You mean he didn't even criticize Labor front leader Baumer? Vagler wanted to work on your farm, didn't he? What did he say when he was refused permission? He hardly ever spoke of it. He just told me that he was called for the army. Oh, he didn't want to go to the army, surely. He's no youngster. He only told me tonight. I don't know what he felt. He was just talking crazy, like I said. So you think Vagler was crazy, and that's why he set off the signal. He had no accomplices. Yes, sir. He must have been crazy to do a thing like that. That's the only explanation I know. Hello, Soda. This is Bomber. Is Vagler conscious yet? No. I want you to wake him. I'm sorry, Soda, but... you're not cooperating. An hour, I face a meeting with the superintendent. I've got to see Vagler before that. Why can't you use smelling salts or give him some drug? It's this way, Bauma. I might give him a strychnine injection, Would but... Would that, that bring him to consciousness? It might, but... Give it to him. Just listen a moment, please. I promise you I'll do as you say, but listen to the facts first. I'm listening. The strychnine might bring him to consciousness, but it might also kill him. I'll take a chance. He's no good to me this way. But he might die before he's had a chance to talk, and oh, then... Oh, yes, Soldier. I have an appointment for each shop. The entire factory is to meet. By that time, I want what's behind this business of Vagler's if I have to tear it out of his guts with pliers. You hear me? All right, Bama. At 8 o'clock. No later. He's still unconscious, Doctor. Incredible. Well, we'll try the straight. So they're going to give me a stimulant. Well, it won't do any good, Doctor. I'm going to die tonight, not before. And you won't get anything out of me. Go ask Fao Ling. She'll tell you. Fao Ling, my betrothed, who betrayed me. Not for her, the arrow of burning hay would have blazed up unhampered. <laughs> Yet I, I don't hate Bertha Ling. She was a good woman. And she loved me. <laughs> Curious how we first met. Well, so you're awake at last. Now get out of my house and quick or I'll call the police. Well, are you going? If you please. How did I get here? You broke in like a robber, that's how. Broke in? I suppose you don't remember. I didn't mean it. I was drunk. My mind's a blank. Oh, yes, I know you men. Pigs, everyone. Please, I'm so sorry. i leave right away or... Only tell me where I am. In my farmhouse, that's where. You're from the factory, I suppose. The factory's down the road. The pity you couldn't land there where you belong instead of coming here and breaking things like a madman. Breaking things? What did I break? There, the glass. Oh, oh well, don't worry. I'll, I'll pay you for it. And the dog. Will you pay me for him, too? What do you mean? My dog that you killed last night. I? How did I kill him? How should I know how you killed him? You did. Then you came into my kitchen and broke the glass and spread yourself out on the floor and slept here all night. I'll pay. Of course I'll pay. I'm an honest man. If you say I killed your dog, I'll make good. The next day I went back to the farmhouse and paid. Then I went to her farm again. We talked. Where do you come from, Herr Wegler? Dusseldorf. Ah, Dusseldorf. You have a family, I suppose? No. I had a boy and a wife howling. My boy died at the attack on Narvik. My wife was killed in a bombing. <laughs> and now I'm alone. Ah, I hate the war, too. The war killed my husband. It's two years now, and it's almost a year that they took my son, Rudy. He was only 17. When I was 17, I was in the last war. You? You're a fine man, Herr Wegler. But why do you have to drink like a pig? Why do you turn yourself into such a beast? I... I never drank before. I don't like to get drunk even now. It's just that... You see, it's lonely in the factory, and when I think of my wife... I can't stand to think of my wife. I see her lying on the ground with her face all cut up, her arms cut off. 
body looking like some butcher who dug his knife into her. Makes me want to kill somebody. I understand, Herr Vega. I understand. Pulse 101, Doctor. Do you think we'll really have an air raid tonight? I don't know. It's possible. Bauma tells me they have already begun to build fortifications and some guns are coming in this morning. Syringe, please. Yes, I can see them from here. Looks as if the whole factory's out there digging. Here you are, Doctor. I must hold still. Mustn't move. Think of something else. That night in front of the farmhouse when Berta and I discussed our coming marriage. Ah, what a night. Smell the air, will you? Yes, it's beautiful. Listen to me, Berta. I want to tell you something. I am listening. Let's get married. Oh, there you go again. I told you we must get permission from my son, Rudy. Legally, he owns this farm, and he must approve. But what if he says no? Anyway, it's crazy for two grown-up people to ask a boy of 18 for permission to marry. He won't say no. Then why don't we get married now? That I can't do, Willie. After all, my own son. In decency, I have to let him know beforehand. I've just explained the law to you. We're hereditary peasants. I understand the law. But what if your boy does say no? <laughs> he won't. I promise. You don't answer me, Bertha. I say, let's get married. You, you think I need this farm to support you? I don't. Oh, you. Like a phonograph record. Good night, my phonograph record. I'm going to sleep now. And you'd better go to sleep, too. And stop worrying over your stupid worries, whatever they are. Worry? Why? Who worries? You do. It's no use lying to me. I wish you could get another job. That terrible hammer you work with all day. It's enough to drive a man crazy. You know, Beth, I've started thinking the same thing myself. I, I don't like the hammer so much anymore. It, it seems harder now. Well, never mind, Willie. Soon we'll get married, won't we? And then you'll come and live on the farm. <laughs> That's what I was thinking. For another little while, Bertha, I guess I can't stick it out. And then he came home. Her son, Rudy. You ready for the coffee now? Yes, Mama. Bring it in. Ah, it's a wonderful meal, Mama. <laughs> hey, Willie. <Willy. laughs> certainly yeah. was, especially this champagne. <laughs> you certainly got a lot of nice things in France, Rudy. Those sweaters <laughs> and the nightdresses and the mm, perfume. Yes. Rudy said he picked them up for practically nothing. Uh, you know who had it, Lucky? The first soldier that went into France. He used to spread butter on candy bars, they told me. Stores were half cleaned out by the time I arrived. How rich those Frenches must have been. Yeah, rich and fat and stupid. French always used to boast of their culture. What culture? I know more than barbarians have their minds on good living and money. But this champagne they make it. Some stuff. Hey, Willie. <coughs> Rudy, your, your mother has written to you. We, we want to get married. I, I assure you. Oh. So you want to get married, eh, Willie? Well, 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 well. Rudy, please say yes now. You're leaving tonight. Yes, I'm leaving tonight. Leaving my farm. Sure, why not get married? What do I care? Likely send me to the front and I get killed No, anyway. no, Rudy, don't say things like that. But listen, I want one thing understood. I run the farm. What I say goes. Absolutely. I give you my hand on Oh, it. isn't it uh. wonderful, Willie? Now you'll be able to leave your job in the factory and come to work on the farm. What you wanted all your life, Willie. Oh, I can hardly believe it. Better, better. Wake up. Uh -huh. I have to talk to you. Oh, Willie. What's the matter? Did anything happen to Rudy? No, no, he took the train. Bertha, everything's turned rotten. You and I... We want to make a good life together, yes. I used to think we could live on this farm like, like it was an island away from everybody. And now we can't. Why? 
What happened? Listen, tonight we had a celebration. So? It's so nice to drink champagne, to smoke decent cigarettes. And Rudy, your son, brought you presents, perfume, nightgowns, a sweater. And what of that? I'll tell you how Rudy got them, Bertha. But Rudy told me when he was drunk. Uh, she was a rich French woman, Rudy said. She lived outside a small town. She had an estate with a large farm. The day before the trucks were to come and take away the grain, she burned down the farm. So Rudy was sent with the others to arrest her. They didn't wait for anyone to open the door. They broke it down. A woman ran out of bed in her nightgown, a pink one <gasps> like the one you're wearing. Then Rudy's corporal, who was in charge, told the woman she was under arrest. She didn't say anything. Only she asked the corporal if she could have a few minutes to get dressed. He told her yes. Then, when she went into her room, the corporal called the men together. Listen, he said. This is how Rudy told me. That woman is going to be shot this morning. Why should we let her go to her death unhappy? You saw for yourself. She's all right. Will we have some fun with her? So they all lined oh, up. Oh, stop and it. Stop it. Then, before they took her away, the soldiers went to her closet. The corporal told them, help yourselves, boys. <laughs> so that's how a German mother got a fine sweater and two nightgowns and a bottle of perfume. Oh, what do you want me to say, Willie? It isn't women who make war. You don't understand, Bert. It's not just war itself. It's that Rudy wasn't ashamed. Rudy was proud. Rudy was proud. Listen to me, Bertha, there's rottenness here. When Rudy was telling me his story, laughing the way he did, I wanted to kill him. This rottenness I won't live with. I won't live with it. I'm a decent man. Your name is Baronsky? Yes, sir. Stefan Baronsky. Now then, Baronsky... You have any knowledge of Vegler's motivation for setting that fire? Did he have any Confederates that you know about? Did you see anyone with him? No, sir. He himself alone came to the barn and talked to me. Vegler spoke to you? What about? He wanted me to escape, sir. But I wouldn't. You're lying. No, sir, I swear it. He came to me in the barn. Go on. He... He spoke to me through the little window. First he gave me a cigarette, but I told him... It was forbidden to, for me to smoke. Then he... He said he would write a letter for me to my home, but I said it was forbidden, sir. Come to the escape. Yes, sir. Then he... He said he would break open the barn doors for me any night. He said he would bring me clothes and, and some money and his own police card, sir. So why didn't you escape? It's forbidden to escape, sir. I see. And did he tell you why he wanted to do all this for you? No, sir. Just that he wanted to help me, sir. Did you know him someplace before? No, sir. Did he ever speak to you before two nights ago? <laughs> no, sir. Why did he want to help you then? For your good looks? I don't know, sir. You don't know? No, of course you don't know. He was crazy, that's why. Crazy as a bed bug. I tried to tell you, Bertha. I tried. Oh, Willie, it's all arranged. I've written to the labor front leader in your factory, and in a few days you'll be transferred to the farm. Well, darling, don't you have anything to say? Bertha, who is in the barn? In the barn? Why, a Pole, of course. He's to work for me. Seventeen marks I had to pay. Bertha, how can you? How can you even say it? You bought a man, Bertha. You paid money for a human being. But these are prisoners. Besides, I'm a farmer, Willie. You're not. If I don't meet my quotas, they'll take away my farm. You want that? I want... I want you to take back the pole. Take him back? Are you crazy, Willie? I already paid for him. Should I return the pole and let my hay rot? Yes, yes. Oh, sure. How easy it is for you to talk. It isn't your farm. What do you care? But I do care. Bertha, darling, take the pole back. Please, I beg you. I'll work for you at night on Sundays when I'm transferred. Bertha, listen to me. You listen to me. This is your responsibility, too. We're to be married, remember. And I'm not to blame for the war. I didn't start it. No, I don't really blame you, Bertha. You just didn't understand. When you betrayed me, you were only doing something that's been bred into you. Well, Willie, what did the labor front leader say? When can we get married? Bertha, I'm not to be transferred to the farm. You're not? 
Oh, well, in a few months, maybe. Berta, they've called me for the army. Oh. Well, never mind. The war will end soon. Berta, I'm not going to their army. I have something to do. What do you have to do? What are you talking about? I have something to do. A deed. You don't make sense, Willie. It's like... uh, I mean what Rudy did, you see. I'm guilty, too. It's like I brought you the sweater myself. I've been part of it. I make tanks. And you've been part of it, too, with the farm and the pole. We're all guilty. Willie, I think you're drunk. We're swine, Bertha. They've turned us all into swine. Now they want me to volunteer for the army. It's more war they want, more killings and more sweaters and more people to sell in the village at 17 marks. I won't do it. I stop here right now. I stop. Somebody has to say no to them. Well, what'll you do? Bertha, will you help me? Oh, you're crazy. Oh, you're tired. What are you doing? What are you doing with a kerosene? Willie, come back here. Willie! I wonder what time it is. It's dark. Soon they'll come. Dear God, let them come. Don't let them go anyplace else. It must be here tonight. Aren't you better hurry or you'll miss the execution? What's all the excitement? Oh, they finally found out who set off the fire. It was the Pole who worked on the woman's farm, and he's being executed. He confessed. Oh? I heard it was Vigler. Well, confidentially, I heard it too. But how would it look for the morale of the factory if they told us Vigler did it? Yes, that makes sense. Of course. So now they're executing the pole, and the whole incident will soon be forgotten. Unless the British plane saw the signal. Yeah, that would be too bad. Well, let's go watch the fun, huh? Let them come. Let them come. Blast the factory. Kill them all. Wipe them out. here. They're here. Now all this will be wiped out. All their rottenness. My signal was seen. Now, the only thing I have to do is rip off the bandage. It will be all over. My deed has been accomplished. Maybe there will be Others who will follow. Blast them, Britishers. Blast them. at war, we've brought you Albert Maltz's novel, The Cross and the Arrow, adapted for radio by Ben Kagan. The cast included Louis Van Ruten as Herr Wegler, Dorothy Francis as Frau Ling, Ed Begley as Commissar Kerr, and Rhys Taylor as Herr Balmer. The music was arranged and played by William Meader. Production, Garnet Garrison. Next week, Words at War will present the radio dramatization of The Scapegoats of History based upon a YMCA pamphlet by Kenneth M. Gould and The History of Bigotry in the U.S. by Gustavus Myers. This series of programs is brought to you in cooperation with the Council on Books in Wartime by the National Broadcasting Company and the independent radio stations associated with the NBC network. Jack Costello speaking. This is the National Broadcasting Company.